Hello. Sean McNamara, in person, live, with your film Bow, Artist at War. Yes, here at the Myrtle Beach International Film Festival, number 19. That's right. Been around a while, almost two decades. I know. So, <laughs> so, so cool to be a part of it, I got to tell you. Well, we're very thrilled to have you here and to be able to screen your beautiful film. I say it's a tragically beautiful film. I don't know if that describes it properly. I think that's but, fantastic. Uh, the like score it. behind it, mm. whose idea was that? With well, the Prague Symphony. Well, um, John Coda is the composer, and I've known him since we were 16. We were actually in a band together, believe it or not. And he is just the most talented composer ever. He's doing Reagan for me right now. And um, he found an 88-piece orchestra over in Prague that they're just incredible. He flies over there, and I watch him from Los Angeles. And he conducts and just makes an incredible, incredible uh, uh, score. I, and I don't know where he gets it from because... He just does research. Some of the instruments he plays himself, like the nickel harpa yeah. and, um, and the piano. And so he's just so talented. And he just found that perfect sound for this movie. What you, you knocked it out of the park. It really adds to the epic classicness of this film. Uh, they, they say that music is the most powerful medium in the world because it can change your moods within three or four notes. And I believe yeah. that. When you tie that with the visuals that right. you've got, it's extremely powerful. This movie's gonna live on for many, many decades. Oh, thank you. That's so, really nice. I asked you last night real quick, um, so I've already primed you for the question, but okay. I love you, if you could just say what you said last night was, how did you get into film? What was the inspiration? How did it happen? Well, um, I was uh, the baby of uh, six kids. I grew up in Burbank, California, 11 houses away from Disney Studios. And uh, my family went on a trip to Ireland. And for some reason, my dad decided to buy me a Super 8 camera at the Shannon Airport. And it was, you know, just unexpected, but I just put the film in and started shooting right then. And um, it got to be fun. I made little movies around my house with my neighbors. I had no idea the concept of editing. I would like, I would shoot your coverage and then I would stop, turn around, get the next person's coverage, and then just cut it back and forth. So that's how it started. Then I turned it in for like a class assignment. And I, t when I saw the, you know, the kids clapping and I could get out of homework assignments, I went, this is it for me. I gotta just do this. I love this thing. And then I went you know, through high school. I did drama, I did some acting. And uh, I actually got accepted USC as an actor, but I wanted to do cinematography. So I went to Loyola Marymount University and got my degree in filmmaking. Um, and, uh, and then it was just, like anybody else, my first job in the business was plugging in microphones, and uh, I did Reagan's inauguration um, really? in 1981. That was my first job. My, my friend's dad uh, directed the Academy Awards every year, and every year, I'd, please get me a, da a job with your dad. Please get me a job with your dad. So finally, when I was at Loyola Marymount, I said, please get me a job with your dad, and he goes, my dad will meet with you. And I was like, oh. So I walked into his office, and he goes, so kid, what do you do? And I'm like, totally a question I wasn't prepared for, and I was like, I, I um, I'm in a rock band, I, I plug in microphones, and he goes, audio, that's for you. And he calls his buddy up, and the next thing I know, I'm on an airplane to Washington, D.C. to plug in microphones at Reagan's inauguration and the inaugural balls, and that was it. You, you, you just finished rap, uh, principal photography on Reagan, correct? Yes. Um, is this feel spiritual or energy-wise that... That was your first job, and now you are the director of the new film, Reagan, with Dennis Quaid? Yeah, there's a lot of connections with Reagan and my life. For, number one, um, he was the first president I ever voted for in 1981. It was the first job I had in the industry. Um, he was our 40th president. This mm -hmm. was my 40th feature film. So there's a lot of odd connections, but it was it's just amazing that I got the chance to tell this story. And Dennis Quaid is playing Ronald Reagan, right. and he's extraordinary. We got John Voight playing a, um, a Russian spy, and we follow Reagan's life through the lens of this Russian spy who was assigned to follow this uh, young guy who they, as soon as he was the president of the Screen Actors Guild, they started to say, we gotta keep an eye on this guy. And they followed him all the way through being a governor, to being president of the United States and until he passed away. Would you say that Reagan is your largest project to date or what, is there another one that, that you I think I mean, there's is a few, if it, you know, from, 
from sheer, it's going to be opening on August 30th in 3,500 theaters. So that's the largest release I've ever had. Um, but you know, I've done Soul Surfer was a very right, that was big. Uh, nice film that mm -hmm. came out uh, about a decade ago, and um, The King's Daughter with Pierce Brosnan. Uh, that's like this adventure that we shot at uh, Versailles in, in Paris, France. So that was pretty fun too. So the only thing to complete this circle is the Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> From your mouth to God's ears, that's all I can say. Could that happen. Nice. It uh, could happen. You never know. I mean, I think the actors like Dennis and Penelope Ann Miller plays Nancy Reagan. I think they should be recognized. I right. think uh, they would be amazing. And in our film that we're showing here tonight, Bow Artists at War, Emil Hirsch and Imbar Lavi, I, I hope they get considered for many awards because they're just so incredibly talented. Very, very talented. They, yeah. bring, they bring the characters to life. Yeah. You're, you're there in the with camp them. with them, yes, and, yeah. and throughout life. Um, you, you mentioned on the phone when I was talking to you, which really impressed me when you said, I would like to show up a couple days early to watch others' films. Yeah. Because you said you were inspired by filmmakers who submit films to film festival because they're working from strictly a, an artistic perspective yeah. and a perspective from the heart, not so much from the accounting department to right. make sure that it, it has a broad appeal. Do uh, you want to describe what, what the difference is between those two perspectives? Because you're very artistic and you... You're very talented at bringing a story to life. With Soul Surfer, with Bow Artist at War, other films, what is the difference of when you make something that you don't care if it makes money or not, you have to make it because it's something inside versus something that needs to be commercially viable. If you want to stay in the film business, you've got to be commercially viable. Well, what I think is amazing about today and right now is the artist of the filmmaker is going to become apparent. Before, if you were, say, a writer, you could sit down and type out or write your own story. If you were a songwriter, you could play guitar and write your own song. Um, if you were a painter, you could just pick up some paints and paint. But to make a movie, it was always like hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars to make. So the average person could not do that. But now with technology, with like your computer and your iPhone, and an idea, you can go out and shoot your own movie. You can literally cut it together and present it to people. That hadn't been done before. So what I find with like short films especially, and the, the ones at this film festival, is that they can tell their inner voice, whatever they want to say, in a fresh and unique way that we've never seen before. So real artists are coming alive that we would never have heard about before. And that's where I think technology has come to the time of the, the film artists. And it started, I always think, in like the 80s where people were making music videos and it's like you're listening to a song and you could come up with any image that you wanted and I was always so impressed with that or commercials right but now that the person who's 12 13 years old can go and make a movie I mean they can make a feature length film a two hour movie for well, basically next to nothing get their friends involved their buddies shoot it on the weekends that to me is inspiring and I think the first thing is to go and start uh, doing a short just do it over a weekend and you know hire all you really need to do is hire people to bring lunch in because right. when you get your friends together they'll they'll be backing you you know for your first two or three short films and then you come forward with your your story so th that's the thing and then people see your voice and then when the films get bigger the budgets get bigger that's how it works we, we, you you touched on something there about some friends getting together, going out. You can even show it on your, the quality of cameras on the phones anymore oh. are ridiculous. Well, the new iPhone? To be honest with you, there are um, shots in Bow that I shot on my iPhone when I was in Poland. Really? So, oh yeah, definitely. Because it has, you can flip to 4K, so I'm all for this. And yes. I, I've done two or three films now where I've used my iPhone to actually shoot scenes that end up in the final movie and get projected to 50, 60 foot screens and it's right. amazing. Now do you got the iPhone 15 with the ProRes or the 14 was that on? I have the 14. Okay, the 14. But when I shot these, I had the 7. Okay. So. Okay. Well, it, it, I, I happened to, it was my first iPhone. Yeah. And it was because of the camera. So that's why they it's sold the it best. to me. It, it, it's amazing. It's got it, ProRes on it. It's incredible. Yeah. I mean, and, and so, so quickly you can like make something Look and that's good. the, like even when I, you know, I know there's something going on with the government right now in TikTok, but I'll put on TikTok and I'll go, wow, creativity is just blowing out when right. people are actually just making things you never thought of and moving their bodies in ways that we would have never thought of. So filmmaking from, you know, back when it was invented, like with the Nickelodeon, and I still watch like on um, Turner uh, Movie Classics or whatever, mm -hmm. I'll watch those films from like the the teens, 19 teens, and then the 20s, and then the 30s when sound came in, and just watch the progression as it just keeps going, the artistic 
Right. And it's so fun to watch because they were still storytellers 100 years ago. And they, you know, they would shoot a frame and they didn't understand cutting back then, but they would have the actors just perform it in the proscenium. And I was just, right. that's amazing. And now we have all of that for our history and now we can keep moving on their shoulders. Uh, we get a lot of people that are aspiring filmmakers. They want to get into the industry. They, just, you know, they want to go beyond just making the art films, making films for their friends, <coughs> and a few screenings here and there. What would be your advice to someone who is coming along who wants to get into the industry and make it their job, their living, their life, to break through those gates to get in and get started? I'll tell you what I always tell people. Okay. Okay? And see if you agree. Uh, I had a friend who was a judge here, and he had a, a child, and he was going to USC, South Carolina, not, not yeah. the USC, right? right? And I said, you go to USC and UCLA for connections. Sure. Okay? Film school is connections. He was talking about the um, cost. I told him, take him to LA, mm -hmm. tell him to show up on a set, get coffee, sweep the floors, do whatever, show up early, stay late, don't complain, and pretty soon you'll be working in it. Where if you go through the film school route, and you try to go in at the top, it's going to be a lot tougher. And you'll work your way up. And as soon as people on the set see that you're always dependable, always there, providing what's needed, you will work. That's my advice to people to get in when they come and ask me. It's like, just go show up, ask them, sign a waiver, whatever you need to do. I don't want money. I just want to work. I want to be a part of this. Passion. And don't complain. Show up early. Stay late. That's my advice to them always. What is your advice? Because you're way up the ladder from where I'm at. And what would be your advice for someone to come in, not necessarily to be a director right off the bat, but you have, like you said, you start hooking up microphones. Yeah. Okay, first of all, there's many paths, right. and you have to create your own path. It's not great to think about following somebody other's path. For me, it was film school, and there was a lot less information that's available to kids uh, going into you know, 18 or 19 years old right now. Because now you can go on YouTube and learn all the stuff that I had mm -hmm. learned in, in college back then. But your, your idea of, you have to love it. First of all, mm -hmm. like when actors, I'm just gonna say, when they come to Hollywood, they go, yeah, I've come here to give it a year. And I just look at them and I go, I, I, I can save you that year. Yeah. You should go home. Because if, if you think of it like you're only gonna give it a year, it's a calling. You're an actor for the rest of your life. I'm a director for the rest of my life. I met somebody today, literally right here, and she goes, yeah, I'm doing this thing and I'm, I'm quitting the industry. And I was like, wow. So she, at a very young age, knew that she is quitting the industry. And I thought, that's so interesting. But you have to have a passion for it, a passion for acting, a passion to tell stories if you're a director, a passion to write stories. So it doesn't matter if you make money or not make money. Now, that being said, it is so important that you get in and start meeting people. It's just straight networking. Be a PA. I remember I used to pour coffee for people. I used to love to take their cars to get washed because I was in the door and I would do anything for, because I was just around them and it rubs off on you and you just do whatever job you're doing very well and they do notice you. But I also, when I was doing those PA jobs at the beginning, I let people know I wanted to be a director. I actually did say this and I was constantly making whatever I could. And by the time I was done with school, I did have a few things made right. that I could show them. They weren't very good, but this is what I can do. And I think it shows people that, that you're not just talking about it. You can do a start, a right. middle, an end, and here it is. It's easier than ever now. I mean, people do it every day on their iPhones. They make a little video, they send it to somebody. They right. add some music, they send it to somebody. But if you want it to be artistic, like cinematic, it takes a little more, like a story, maybe some credits, and all of that kind of stuff. But you have to love it and just go for it. And your advice is absolutely spot on. Just get into the industry any way you can mm -hmm. and, and just get on a film. P plus, work in all the departments. If you want to direct or produce and you can get on a film, maybe in one you're in the camera department. Mm -hmm. And on the next one on that same year, you'll be in the costume department. And the next one you'll be in the office. Right. The next one you'll be the assistant to the director. You'll just get him coffee or her coffee. Do whatever they ask, but you're learning it all without the pressure of having the responsibility of it. Because a lot of people, I think they fail because they have a too pressurized job right away. Whereas if you're just the assistant kind of helping out, nobody can blame you for anything, but you're sponging up everything. Right. And you're working your way up. Yeah. Having that roundabout aspect, all aspects of filmmaking, whether it be sound, grip, lighting, cameras, yeah. it makes for a better director, wouldn't you say? Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I was the taught... possibilities. Yeah. 
I believe that you just keep, I'm a student of film and I keep learning and you can never stop learning. So by now, yes, I've learned the cameras, I've learned the lenses, you know, I can be looking at a shot and go put a 50 on and right. we're gonna go in here. And I know, I don't need to like look at it or know that, but I constantly learning palettes, learning how, what costumes look good on people. Right. Also learning how to find the best of the best. Like I always look at me like a, a jack of all trades, master of none. I get the best production designer. Who, when I, they come on, they're gonna make me look good because what you shoot is you shoot those sets. Yeah. Secondly, I get a great casting director because you're completely at the mercy of your cast. So directing is kind of pointing them, but if they can't act, they make you look bad really quickly. Mm -hmm. So uh, then a DP, someone who just lights it, just paints it like just an incredible, but you, I can't do that myself, but I know how to pick them and find people who will do that. And then I shoot in different places, so I meet new DPs, new production designers, and they bring their magic, and everybody brings their gold to the table, and then you're like a coach, you're helping everybody do their best, yeah. and it all comes out in the film. Well, it's like a symphony. Everybody yeah. playing their part just perfectly, and right. it makes beautiful music. It, and, it ha and it's all together, and your job is the conductor, like to bring it all together, a little more here, a little less there, but, but to recognize that they have the talent too. Right. Right. Got to ask you this. What's your favorite film of all time? I can't pick one film that was my favorite, but I'll tell you the 10 that got me into the industry. Okay. It was, starts with It's a Wonderful Life, Casablanca, um, Lawrence of Arabia, Rocky, um, Star Wars, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Hannah and Her Sisters, and The Sound of Music. I think that's 10. That's a um, nice variety of But those of are films. the ones that when I, when I watched those, I remember it was on Raiders of the Lost Ark. I was having a terrible day. I was doing audio. I was plugging in microphones somewhere, and they go, hey, let's go to the Grauman's Chinese. There's this movie playing, Raiders of the Lost Ark. I had no idea what it was. I walked into press, and two hours later, I walked out so stoked and happy, and I was like, what just happened? I just watched two hours, and it changed me from being unhappy to super happy. And I went, I want to do that to other people. Right. I want to take them and move them emotionally somewhere. And I just feel, th you know, filmmaking does that. And, and those are the films, like literally before I do any film, I kind of rewatch them again and go, what did I like about how Spielberg did that on, you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark? Or, you know, Jaws is one of my favorites too, because oh, it just yeah. moves you viscerally with images. They don't have to say everything. It's the images that, right. that matter. When that sound comes on, you know. Yeah, when you're, and I think Jaws changed the world more than any other film because no did. one goes out in that ocean the and starts way. swimming when you can't feel your feet and you wonder what's underneath you. Yeah, so it's it I changed was one everything. Of those people. Yeah, it was a great film. Uh, in your in your career, uh, well, let me back up. I always call it you've you've taken the hit when you get into when you love film, you can't get out of it. Right, it's a do or die type thing. Yeah. And it's one of those things when you begin, it's like, I will starve to death before I give this up. Right. Right? And if you don't have that kind of passion, it's going to be really tough to get in. Unless you've got some nepotism in the family. Maybe if Scorsese's your dad or something like that. Right. You might get a little bit of, of leverage there, maybe. But uh, you have to have that fire. This is not an industry for people who want to do it as a nine-to-five. Actors, small right. actors that we've hired, they come, they've never acted before on something large. And they'll come on and... Is it, when are we going to shoot? We're still setting up cameras. We're still setting up lights. Right, right. And something went wrong. You've got to correct it. You can't yeah. just shoot it. Oh, fix it in post. Right? No. <laughs> so what, what are your thoughts on that kind of... A, give me what you think about what I just talked about. Well, first of all, it's a 24-7 job for me. Yep. I can't speak for you everybody. You eat, live, and breathe it. I can hear it in your yeah, conversation. And it, but I love it, so it's not really work for me. No. It's fun, it's like I'm playing. I mean, if I had enough money to pay for all the houses and all the kids and all that stuff, I would do it for free. That's mm -hmm. how much I love it, because right. every time, besides the fact of coming to a great place like this and being able to hang out and watch your film in front of the audience, which is the best part of it ever, yes. when you get to watch it with an audience. But every part of it, I fly to a new state, I have this script and we go and look at all these new locations. I get to walk into people's houses and look right. in their closets that I would have never been invited into. Then we get to get the local cast. We meet the local people and we tell a story. And, and it's so funny, on the last day of shooting, people go, oh, it's so sad, it's ending. And I like look at them and I go, no. we're not even like one fourth of the way through this no. project because 
editing and then the sound and the score and the visual effects and, the, and then the marketing and getting it out there. The shooting is a relatively small uh, period. So to me, but every part of it's great. And you know, when you're on set, yes, you have to have the most energy. You have right. to be out there and so it looks more visually interesting. But it's just as interesting when you're sitting in the editing room with an editor and you're fighting. There were scenes in Bow Artists at War that we just couldn't get right. And I knew what I wanted in my head, but how we would juxtapose these images together to come up with a new idea. And then finally when it happens and you're looking at the screen and you're there at like two in the morning going, oh my gosh, it's working. What we set out to do actually works. It's amazing, it's, there's no better feeling in the world. What do you, what do you think about the evolution of, of the film industry right now? It's changing. Oh yeah. Um, theaters are struggling. Uh, people are leaving Hollywood, they're moving to other places. New studios are opening in Atlanta, opened uh, sure. over a decade ago. Yeah. There's a new one being built in, I think it's Las Vegas, somewhere in Nevada, yeah. a, a big one. Vegas, Really, Texas. like two billion dollars. Yeah. What's your thoughts of, what, 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 where do you see the industry going as far as theatrical releases, uh, streaming, all that. All right, I think it's the same thing that it's always been there. There will be a place for theatrical because people love community. People want to go out on a Friday night, on a Saturday night, be with their friends, sit in a theater, get popcorn, get a drink. It's an event. And there's nothing like watching a movie with a group of people. That, I think, is here to stay. I think the pandemic really shifted everything for a second. To me, streamers are just like television used to be, except the films got better, they're spending more money on it, and then you can watch it anytime you want. That's a big difference. But uh, it, the, the line is getting blurred between movies and, and streaming right now because they're making fantastic movies for streaming, and some of them go out theatrically, some of them are there. And, um, but I still go, how you shoot a movie is definitely different if you're thinking of it in terms of the big screen right. and thinking of it in terms of the small screen. How you, you can stay on a big wide shot much longer because you know you're looking at it at a big screen. And then it will eventually end up on streaming and television and I end up watching movies on my iPhone. And I'm, when you hold it this, it's like I'm in a theater, the, yeah. you get to, to watch and experience that movie. There's so many movies, but I don't think theaters are ever going away. I think as long as we keep giving the audience what they want, spec spectacle, great stories, they will come and, and watch it in the theaters. I think we're still on that path. If you had unlimited budget, let's, let's say someone dropped a, uh, a half a, well, let's say $400 billion in your lap. Ah. There you, I mean, unlimited, right? All what right. is the story? I probably what, could what, make it. What's the story you would tell? What, what, is, what is the film you, that burns in you well, I say, barring any budget, barring any return, no return right. needed. Just what do you, what mark would you want to leave on the world if this is Sean's film? Well, here's the thing: it's it's when you're talking or about have you done it? money. Yeah, you, you sit there and you go. It's never about money. There's no. films that are made, uh, even in this festival. I've heard there's films here that they shot in three days and are really good films. Right. It doesn't matter. It's a good story. So yes, I like seeing a great Cameron film or a Nolan film where it's right. just like they spent gobs of money and it's something we've never seen before. So that sort of stuff. So is I guess fantastic. no restrictions is what I mean. Yeah. No restrictions whatsoever and no pressure. Right. But so, if somebody gave me four hundred million, I'd start sharing it with other filmmakers that was and billion. say, "Let's just go. <laughs> Let's do it." Yeah. Because one of the things that just energizes me is coming to festivals and watching the other filmmakers. And when you see them, that they've right. got some something that's worth seeing, you want to help them get going. Do you have a story that burns in you? to tell that, hasn't, um, that you haven't done yet? I am getting it going. I got the rights to Leon uh, Uris's Trinity. So it's the Irish novel, it's about 800 pages. And I've written the screenplay, co-written the screenplay with David Aaron Cohen. And uh, that's a film that I'm trying to get going, shoot it in Ireland. And I guess it's just my Irish roots where I got my first camera and I'm Sean Patrick McNamara, so <laughs> definitely it's got some Irish background there. And it's the Troubles of Ireland. So. And it's, it's so interesting because you find a story that happens in the late 1800s and yet the problems still exist today. Right. So it's just a nice metaphor to be able to tell a story about that and it have it resonate today. In the power culture. of the human condition. The power of the human condition. And so when you went to Ireland, um, did, you, did, did you go to the docks? Did you make it over to Albert Docks, anything in Liverpool where a lot of people left to come to the United States or from Dublin, anywhere where they would travel in passage? And so, stand on the docks. Yeah, I went to Northern Ireland, like where they built Titanic. Yeah. So that was pretty extraordinary. And I spent a lot of time in Dublin, and my family is from County Mayo. I've been there, and it's just beautiful. When did your family come over? Well, I actually have my Irish passport because it was my grandparents that came over, like in 
nineteen of ten, nineteen eleven. Okay. So it was after the potato famine. Yes. Okay. It was. I, I, when, when I stand on those docks, you get a heartfelt feel of those people standing there yeah. with their children, not knowing if they're going to make it. It's a, two, a month and a half voyage, not yeah. knowing what's on the other side, but you have nothing to go back to. Right. You have nothing to go for and nothing to go back to except for a hope and a dream of making it across that ocean and starting right. a new life. That's it. And there's power. And is this, with, with a, a novel of 800 pages, is it going to be a series or is it going to be condensed into one film? Well, I've written it into a screenplay, but I think after the screenplay is done, it could also be, then be a series or a right. mini-series. Well, we really appreciate having you here. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to enlighten us on about film or? I think we've covered everything. I mean, okay. you know, it, it just if you love film and you're passionate about it, I'm not going to say it's easy. It is hard. But if you love it, it becomes like play, and you just right. have to go it, meet people, and just follow your passion, follow your dream, because you can achieve. If I can achieve it, trust me, anybody can achieve it. Oh, you're being extremely humble. Oh, I can tell you true. that you're being extremely humble. I'm you're extremely you. a talented person. Thank you so much. And so, thank you. you thank bet you for coming.